if we can call to order the April 7th, 2022 Vision Zero Advisory Committee meeting. Margie, if you could please call roll to establish quorum. Yes, ma'am. So at this time, I'm only calling the members present in person. Uh, if you can please state here when I call your name and then please remember uh, that the button on the base is your um, to turn it on and off and when it's red it means it's on. And then if you are an alternate on here on behalf of a representative, if you can please state so. <laughs> Tracy Phelps. Here. Bruce Rosenzweig. Here. Craig Pinder. Here. Ted Goodenough. Joanna Peluso. It's not going. I think you're hitting it too quick. Yeah, it's on now. So at the top, Joanna. <laughs> it's okay. Here. Uh, Joanne Scaria. Here. Fadi Nassar. Here. JC Berry. David Willock. Here. Jean Matthews. Casey Franken in for Jean Matthews. Yash Nagal. Here. Michael Owens. Ryan Harding. I'm here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Ryan Harding. Not in the room. I'm sorry. Yes, it's you're fine, Michael. I'll count your attendance in a minute. Christian Santa here for Ryan Harding. John Roach. Here. Larry Wallace. Was I paid for Larry Wallace? Ryan Ruscher. Present. Stephanie Thoburn. Here. We have a quorum in person, Madam Chair. Okay, great. Um, are there any modifications to the agenda? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. I do have Michael Owens, and he is online, um, that he requested a permission to participate remotely. Um, he noted the school district is still experiencing staff shortages, and his presence at the office is required. Are there any members of the VZAC who have objections to allowing Michael to participate remotely? Seeing none, we approve your participation remotely. And Thank please you. note the attendance. Okay. Um, next item, motion to approve the minutes for March 3rd. Are there any changes to the minutes? John. Uh, just one clarification under 1F. Under the liaison reported, indicated that I confirmed the upcoming panel would be hosted in person. I think it was confirmation that it was going to be held virtually as well as in person. So just for point of clarification. Thank you. We'll make that correction, Madam Chair. Okay. Any other changes to the minutes? Do we have a motion in the minutes? Oh, okay. No, I'll make the motion. Okay. David. Michael Owen, second. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> approved. And the next item. is uh, general public comments. Instructions are provided for public comments are included in the agenda and staff, do we have any general comments that have been received that we need to? No general public comments. Okay. Okay, so comments from the board. Does anybody have any comments? We'll start over here on this side. Anybody? Joanna? I just want to say thank you to the TPA. I was invited by my uh, sister initiative, Healthier Glades, to go out to the South Bay walk audit where they did it around uh, Rosenwald Elementary School. And um, it was a really great experience. And I know that the community members, it was very community member led and heavy and they were really, really appreciative of the TPA staff and time to come out there because they oftentimes uh, feel like not a lot of people take the time to come out and spend time and learn about the issues in their community. And they've definitely identified walking and biking safety, especially for kids, as a priority. Um, so I, I personally am really grateful, and I know I'm passing a message along from um, them as well that they were grateful. So. 
And I think it would be really kind of, there were some really amazing community leaders in that group as well. And I wonder if throughout the TPA's uh, various committees, if there could be representation from someone from that group on, on one of the committees. Thanks. Great. Is there any other comments? I just wanted to say thanks for filling in, Andrew. Um, since Alyssa uh, resigned as our bike ped coordinator, um, we'll be calling you. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? All right. So we'll move on to the next item, um, which is the liaison report given by Andrew. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'll try to bring the positive energy that she brought. It's not going to last, though, but... Um, but just on that note, um, we do have the pedestrian bicycle coordinator position open. It's a lead planner position. Um, obviously, they're the liaison for here, and they also uh, are the ones in charge of the TA program, um, which we're talking about today. And then also, they do a lot of bike pedestrian advocacy throughout the, uh, the county, and they work with both local partners in the state on designing uh, roadways. So if you have anybody who's interested in that position, it's open. And then we also have the transit coordinator position, which is a lead planner position that's also open. And they're doing a lot of the um, working with Palm Tran, SFRTA, and they also handle our corridor studies. So if you have any um, people who are interested, you can send them to our website and uh, they'll be open until filled. So going through the liaison report, just have a few uh, highlights that is also on the presentation. Uh, first is we hosted a mobility and economic development panel. It was on March 31st. Uh, it discussed mobility and economic development trends. It had a good turnout and uh, was well-received. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, uh, I suggest uh, checking it out. Bell Glade also passed Vision Zero uh, targets of zero fatalities and serious injuries um, after TPA passed their resolution. And so we'd like to congratulate them on adopting that Vision Zero resolution in March 23rd. Next slide, is that me? No, it is me, okay. Uh, National Bike and Roll to School Day. It's going to be celebrated on March, or May 4th to encourage local municipalities and, and schools to celebrate. Uh, you can get more information at walkbiketoschool.org. And then we're hosting another round of our Oak Tree Boulevard and State Road 7 Multimodal Quarter Studies, uh, a public workshop. And it's going to be held in person uh, here at the TPA office on May 10th from 2 to 4 p.m. For more information, you can go to palmbeachtpa.org slash Oki. So the update information is there. Uh, we're presenting the alternatives uh, and the analysis on that at that workshop. And then lastly, we're hosting a, another Vision Zero virtual workshop on May 13th from 2 to 4 p.m. And you can register at palmichipa.org slash VZ workshop. Uh, we're going to try to have uh, the Vision Zero network there as well as uh, FHWA. Um, it's going to be virtual because they couldn't make it um, out and it's more expensive for them to come out I and mean, fly out, but it's going to be a great virtual workshop to uh, just have the latest on Vision Zero and, and how to adopt it and implement it into your communities. And then next is multimodal project discretionary grants. There's a lot of uh, FHWH, FHWA grants out there. Um, some of the larger ones are combined this year, MEGA, Infra, and Rural grants into this multimodal product discretionary grants. Uh, notice of funding opportunities. The applications are due on May 23rd and you get more information at transportation.gov slash grants. And the next governing board meeting is gonna be hosted on April 21st at 9 a.m. both in person and virtually. Thank you. Okay, so now we start on our action items. Um, the trans 2022 transportation alternatives program project application rankings and Jason Price is going to present this item. Is he? I don't see Jason. Uh, he's sick today, so I'll be presenting this <laughs> okay. item. I'm the TPA today mostly with Margie. Just give me a second to share my screen. Oh, it's already being um, shared. Okay. Uh, actually, I want to I share my own screen, if that's okay, uh, Amanda. If you could exit this one. One second. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. 
Okay, so I'll be going through the, uh, the, the applications that we see this year for the transportation alternatives. Uh, there is four applications total, and you'll see in the next few slides here that, um, and also available in the backup, uh, that the requested funding is actually uh, less than the, the amount we have available. So we're, uh, most likely these will all be funded and we'll have a little bit of, of extra money available um, that typically goes to cost overruns and, and others. But uh, we shortened this to just having it during a regular uh, VZAC meeting. Uh, we've had them in the past in the afternoons, uh, but since we've had these to four applications, uh, we chose to have it during this meeting uh, to, to short the, the, the amount of time um, for you all and for staff. Uh, I believe we also have some of the applicants available over virtually. So if you did have questions for applicants, uh, we can uh, address them to them. And then I'm just gonna have one slide for each one and I'm just gonna run through this presentation for you all. So the Transportation Alternatives Program, uh, it funds on off-road pedestrian bicycle facilities and safe routes to schools. Uh, it's around $3.3 million available right now uh, of what we have. We actually anticipate that to go up quite a fair bit uh, in the coming years here with the new legislation. Uh, but right now we're maxing projects at, at $1 million per project and with a minimum of $250,000. And it typically goes to uh, here to TPA sidewalks, bike facilities, pedestrian bicycle signage and signals, uh, lighting and, and safety improvements. And the scoring and how we score these is really related to our, our goals, objectives and, and measures and targets in our long range transportation plan. And so the, the scoring that you all adopt is, is supposed to be in line and consistent with how we're trying to move forward as, as a TPA and what we should prioritize. Uh, this year, we have four grant applicants, Palm Beach Gardens, Indian Trail Improvement District, Rural Palm Beach and West Palm Beach. Just an update of where we're at with the schedule. Uh, so we had our submittals uh, late February, early March, and now they've been being vetted by FDOT and the TPA. Um, and we sent out initial notice to them about some, some follow-up information for them to receive. Uh, but right now, today, it's the BZAC project ranking. And then we'll get responses from them on some other vetting issues uh, around April 11th. And then there's gonna be virtual field visits with FDOT and the TPA staff and the applicants. And then there'll be another round of vetting uh, questions and follow-up uh, from FDOT and the TPA. And then there'll be a final eligibility determination by May 27th. And then you all, with your draft rankings, uh, you'll see it one more time in your list of priority products. So the way we present it in the list of priority products with our other, other funding programs, which are state road modifications, local initiatives, and there's transportation alternatives, that's where you'll see your ranking uh, of the four, along with all the other products uh, in the previous years uh, in that list. And then the final adoption is for July 21st. And then that is given to FDOT to uh, create the new version of the work program for the following year. So here are the four product submittals. Uh, I re-ranked these uh, just this morning. Uh, so it varies from what you had in your backup. Uh, Margie provided a printout of, of the new summary uh, for you all today. Uh, but you can see the four in the, the TPA ranking and the amount requested. Uh, so it's Indian Trail Improvement District, the shared use pathways and, and sidewalk expansions, Palm Beach Gardens, uh, Fair Child Avenue, sidewalks and buffer bike lanes. There's weight binding in Royal Palm Beach. And then there's traffic calming and bicycle improvements for West Palm Beach. And so the total available is around 3.3. And uh, the total requested from that is about 3.1. So uh, there is a little bit right now uh, a surplus in, in funding there. I'm just going to go one slide for each just to, to have a brief summary. Again, if you have any questions, we can um, you can address, direct them to me and we can also ask the, the applicants. Uh, the first one, Indian Trails Improvement District. Uh, this one is their higher scored one. It's actually 44 points. Um, and really the higher scoring is because they have put, they're putting a lot of shared use pathways, which score high in our, in our TA scoring criteria. They're putting over two, two miles worth of shared use pathways. And they're also expanding some of the sidewalks to eight foot pathways. Uh, locations being Hamlin Boulevard, Great View, uh, Citrus Grove as well. And I believe this is a, a, a similar request that they had last year for other uh, roadways. The next one is Palm Beach Gardens buffered bike lanes and sidewalks uh, on Fairchild Ave from Fairchild's Gardens Avenue to uh, Campus Drive. Uh, it's going to install buff buffered bike lanes, uh, and also a sidewalk on the south side of the roadway. And it's uh, 
total request is closer to a million dollars, 983,000. Next is Royal Palm Beach wayfinding. Uh, there's multiple wayfinding uh, items in this. There's gonna be shelters with bike racks, 23 kiosks, and then 75 wayfinding guide signs. Uh, total requests being 773,000. And I know the, the, the map there is hard to see, but it's throughout Royal Palm Beach. It's village wide. And then lastly, there's traffic calming and ADA improvements and bike improvements for West Palm Beach. And that's on 49th Street from Greenwood Ave to North Flagler Drive. Uh, so it's going to include sidewalks, ADA curb ramps, traffic calming speed humps, and then bicycle share rows. And this one scored the lowest out of the, the projects. It's a shorter segment. And then you typically, uh, we don't really give points for bicycle share rows. Um, they do have a lot of other items on there with sidewalk improvements and, and ADA curb ramps and speed humps. So they get points for that. Um, but when you don't have a large amount of facility, you typically don't score um, very high in, in the TA program. And so this one, um, and also the, the, like I said, it's a, it's a shorter segment and the cost is 368,000. And once again, this is that summary of submittals. So it's the four products ranked in order from Indian Trail Improvement District, City of Palm Beach Gardens, Royal Palm Beach, and then West Palm Beach. And that's all I have for you all uh, on that scoring summary. And so the, the staff recommendation um, is to uh, obviously go in an order of the TPA ranking, but leave it to you to discuss. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Um, are there any public comments on this item? Uh, no, Madam Chair, I do not have any hand raised. I did want to note one thing. I, Michael, I forgot to, um, before we started the meeting, send you a copy of what Andrew said changed. I did email it to you um, because we did provide a printed copy in person um, for this scoring change that he noted. So that should be in your inbox. Thank you. But no public comments, Madam. Yes, I, I have it. Thank you. Okay. okay. Oh. Bruce. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I confess ignorance. Could you explain what wayfinding is? Sure. And actually, I could probably bring up an example for you. Um, but wayfinding is really about um, when, with the bicycle trails, it's going to provide like um, signage for how many miles until a nearest facility is a park or another trail system. So it's, it's what you would see typically on that. Um, there could also be wayfinding for um, uh, that one's be for other types of facilities or destinations that the village is trying to promote, right? So you'll see possibly ones um, to other parks or if it's a town hall, it could really be any type of facility. And I may have an example if, if you give me a minute to um, see what they're providing. But you, you can go on delegate questions if you'd like. Okay, Tracy, do you have question, comment? Yeah, qu I've got uh, quite a few. Um, are the applicants available in case needed? Yes, they're all, um, okay. Yes, they're all online. So I just wanted to make sure if I said that they are all available. The first one, Indian trails. My research shows there's no right of way out there that they want to put the sidewalks in. So I assume it's all on some type of access easement. Uh, so I was just wondering what the wording in that easement says and whether they are allowed to actually put sidewalks without, uh, on, in those easements. Mm -hmm. The drainage out there looks to be horrible. So I don't know that adding more impervious area to the roadway that the existing drainage will be able to handle it. Um, if they're widening the sidewalk on the inside, that's gonna come in and conflict pretty much with every driveway mitered in section or culvert wall for every driveway. So that would mean the mitered in section or the driveway culvert would need to be redone. And I don't think that cost was probably uh, put in their estimate. There's also on, Grow great view. There appears again. There Sorry, Tracy. Can you do me a favor and bring your mic closer? Because I think okay. they're only catching every few words. On Thank great you. view uh, road, there appears to be the, there would appears to be some environmental concerns with wetlands uh, by 
widening the sidewalk there. Um, so that was that one. Um, Fair, Fairchild. Um, there appears to be a lack of right way on the east end to actually widening the road for a buffer and or put a sidewalk in. Uh, there, there are a lot of trees. If you start widening the road to put the bicycle buffer in, there's gonna be a lot of trees along that stretch. It's gonna to have to be removed. Uh, that's usually uh, a pretty uh, controversial issue because um, I don't want a tree uh, within the clear zone, even for a bicyclist. I don't want them falling off the edge of pavement and smacking their head up against a tree because there are clear zone requirements. And uh, it appears, again, that there will be drainage problems, and those problems would likely go on off the uh, roadway right away into private property. Uh, so I have concerns about that one. Uh, no concerns on the village of Royal Beach or Royal Palm Beach. Um, the West Palm Beach, the last one, uh, just looks like a lot of the residents uh, build off their yards all the way to the road and do that with uh, plant, plant planters and uh, other things. Uh, look, so putting a sidewalk in uh, would, tear, would tear a lot of that work that they've done out. So I would want need would want to know that the residents have approved this project and have no problem with this project. There's also light poles and also trees and every in the in the uh, uh, location where you think that the sidewalk would go. Yes, so those are my questions. Uh, the drainage drainage. Uh, so drainage costs can get expensive if they're not taken into account, uh, especially for the first for the first one. Madam Chair, I'm not sure if you want um, to go in order of the for the applicants. So if you want Indian Trail to address Tracy's comments first. Yeah, if we could just start with the first item that okay. you brought up, um, Tracy and have them respond. Okay. So I do have uh, Indian Trail on the line that they'll, you can unmute on your end and then um, go ahead when you're ready. Okay, um, can all of you hear me? This is Joe Capra with CapTech Engineering. Yes. Okay, thank you first of all for hearing from us. We do appreciate the staff's recommendations and, and Tracy, uh, good comments. Um, we actually did receive a letter from the DOT on several of those and we will be responding to that for the 11th, okay, that's our deadline for those to respond to all those comments. So many of your comments are the same. So unfortunately, we kind of have some understanding of a couple of things. So first thing I would like all of you to understand uh, is Indian Trails is a, a, a 298 district. Basically all our um, transportation items are paid for solely by our residents, okay? And uh, basically the first question Tracy talked about was um, right away. Each one of these um, tra each one of these corridors has adequate work right away. They're 80 foot right away existing. Okay, um, but I should explain to you something. A lot of the roads in the Indian Trails, um, basically, the ownership from the lot goes all the way to the center of the road. But the but the district does own 40 feet either side of that for transportation improvements and they have the right to put those in those locations. So one of the questions we did get from DOT was to provide those plats that show that, okay? We've done that before on prior applications. So, so certainly, Tracy, our intention is to put everything in the existing rights of way that we own or that we have the right to. We may not own them, but we have easements for them, okay? And, and they probably have a designation that our attorney could tell you, and we'll be happy to provide that to the DOT. But essentially, we've run into this same comment on many of our improvements, but again, everything will be put into locations where we have the right um, for, for, for uh, improve these transportation improvements. Again, we have a total of 80 feet out there on each one of these roads rights away. So, okay. Um, I'm gonna try to remember all the items. Okay, first of all, the location of the paths, um, you are absolutely correct. Drainage is very important for Indian Trails Improvement District. Two things, um, first of all, um, we, um, 
first of all, did a mobility plan that, that thank you, you all helped us pay for with the Treasury Coast Regional Planning Council. And the improvements we are proposing here are part of that mobility plan that we approved and adopted back in 2000, December of 2020, okay? So this is, this is all part of a, a grand plan for transportation improvements throughout our uh, district, okay? And basically, typically these, these are also for the benefit of all our residents, basically for walking, getting from one destination to another. These, these, these paths are strategically placed so that we can get, uh, we can get uh, our residents and our users of, of, of these parks from one park to the next, so say, okay. So I just want you to know there is a, there's a, there's a madness here that we have of, uh, you know, we try to basically make sure we can get not only vehic uh, vehicular traffic is one thing that happens out there, but we wanna make sure we have our pedestrians, our bicyclists, as well as our equestrian users have the right to get from one park to the next, okay? And so um, to answer your question, most of the reason why we, um, we widen the sidewalks in, in the past, we, we basically put them on the road, the right of way line, and we move, we, we place them inwards, which you're right, there is a swell there. But if you um, note our application, it did include, um, it did include driveway crossings that we will have to improve upon. Like you mentioned that some of those culverts will have to be readjusted. Um, but unfortunately, the existing sidewalk, and it's what's out there, five foot sidewalk, is usually right up against that right of way, okay? So, our only way of expanding it is into the right of way. We have included not only our driveway improvements, culvert improvements, but we also have in, in, in proposing an improvement at some of the intersections, what we call bioswells, okay? We want to try to enhance our stormwater system out there. And we've been doing that all along the district. Uh, uh, is, is obviously conscious of making sure that our swell system works. As you probably know uh, in the plan, you'll see that we basically have a swell between the road and the, and the sidewalk, the swell and the equestrian trail. Um, basically, they ultimately go to canal systems that we have throughout all of these areas and they discharge into those canal systems and obviously flow, flow through to our, our, our major control systems that go to the south, okay? So there, there is an, a, 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 a pretty much master stormwater program that we have for the district. And, and that's quite frankly, a, a, a very important item that we have to comply with. So uh, I, I believe, I believe your, our response on the 11th will show you how we do address everything that you've just mentioned about stormwater. Uh, the next thing, um, let's see, the, I've talked about driveways, I've talked about right-of-ways, great view, um, great view right-of-way, um, you are right that on some of the outside areas, but in the right of way, they're, they're pretty much cleared within the right of way already. And we know that there is a tight area in that section. So we will obviously have to, we may have to make some adjustments to the drainage when we get into the final design, but we, we will account for that in our, our response on the 11th also. Um, we do not intend to Im uh, impact any wetlands with this work. There's no intention of doing that at all. Uh, we intend to stay within already what is a cleared right of way and we will make adjustments to our drainage system to accommodate this. Um, I don't know, Tr Tracy, did I have a, did I miss any of your comments? Um, uh, we, we are considering crosswalks, uh, basically uh, relative to existing. First of all, all these, with the exception of uh, the first road on our list, which is Hamlin, which is a gravel road um, out there right now, we, we do already have a sidewalk on one side that will widen and then a, a equestrian trail on the other side. Obviously, there's already an equestrian park on Hamlin, and that's one of the reasons we, we want to put this system in place. <clears throat> but the other ones are already paved roads. I wanted you to understand we have paved roads. Uh, another item that we do uh, work on with other funding that you guys have been providing relative to LI, we, we are uh, considering uh, a lot of traffic coming out there in the district. These roads are 40 miles per hour roadways we want to keep the pedestrians away from we want to keep them away from the, the vehicular traffic out there uh, so we're, we're we're making a lot of improvements in, in both these areas both both pathways but also traffic calming to to kind of make it safe for our residents i can answer anything else tracy that i may have missed i apologize i didn't uh, no, no you answered everything i was just wanting to make sure that all those um think cost 
uh, the driveway cost and um, other issues that might come up as as can as uh, has been considered in the cost estimate so there wouldn't be any major overruns or and it sounds like uh, everything's you've considered all everything I had uh, questions about. Thank you. Thank you. And like I said, we'll be responding on the 11th with specific write up about some of these comments you made. They're very good comments. Thank you so much. So Palm Beach Gardens applicant, unless Joanne wants to respond. <laughs> I would be happy to, but I think a lot of the questions are more engineering oriented. So if, if our engineering staff wants to answer the questions, that's fine. I'm happy to jump in as needed. Okay, and I, uh, Mike, I do see that you're on. I'm not sure if any, no, nobody else from Garden. So Mike, if you are, if you want to unmute so you can answer uh, Tracy's questions for me. You're gonna have and to. Tracy, you might need to re-ask them so they're fresher. Oh, uh, the Palm Beach Gardens one was uh, the trees that would be torn down, would have something, would either be, uh, I think they, a lot of the trees would have to be removed because they're close to the edge of pavement now. So widening the road uh, for anything that's going to affect those trees. And uh, I was worried about the uh, drainage and the right of way on the east end of this corridor. It's gets pretty uh, narrow yes, because so the road's already wide, wide at that end. So I'm, I'm not sure that you can fit I, everything in there that you want to with. I can say that on the east side of the right of way on the south side where we're proposing the sidewalk that is already an existing sidewalk. there is so we'll only be adding the bike lanes in that section and we have very wide lanes in that area so we think we can accommodate it within the 80 foot right of within way. the what about the existing roadway because if you if you do widen the road that's going to bring that's going to add I, I just want to know where the extra drainage is going to go from that impervious pavement. Well, I, we don't want drainage going on to offsite. They don't know about the construction on the north side. And I don't want to get too technical, but uh, these are just issues that I've Where's your camera? ran into myself designing projects. Zoom. Click it. Click my name. Oh, there it is. Stand by, yeah. we're having technical difficulties. We got a little bit of technical difficulties here. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Okay, for some right. reason, we can't get our camera the camera's up. not. Camera's not up. Um, so in particular, what we're going to do here is we're going to actually take most of the area out of the median in there. Okay. The additional area. There's uh, some residents along that side where we're going to put the additional sidewalk over there. And as you can see where the tennis court is, that tennis court, we do have a small pinch point there. We do have to remove some of the trees in that particular area and some of the other vegetation, but that's not going to be an issue. We've worked out that area. You can see as that road shifts there, that's sort of a little pinch point for us, but we'll be able to maneuver everything in there. As you can see, you got EC theater library. to the south, you got the library to the north and the governmental center, and then obviously you got Palm Beach State College here. We just completed uh, our first mobility improvements on Campus Drive, 12-foot sidewalks on the west and seven-foot sidewalks on the east. So this will tie into that, as, you know, continue our mobility theme and continue to build on our mobility plan. But there will be some vegetation that has to be removed that will be replaced in that area. The drainage has already been accounted for and we can maneuver some of the drainage and drainage won't be an issue at all on this project. Okay. Because it's a, we got an 80 foot right away and we got no sidewalk on the north. So we've got a lot of area to maneuver in here. Just, yeah. to, okay. just a, maybe a larger philosophical question about the program. You go through and apply for this project for this fiscal year. And then over the next two to three years, the city goes about doing design, which I think is what maybe Tracy has dealt with a little bit. So a lot of the issues with respect to easements, waterway drainage, permitting, and that type of work is yet to be determined, but maybe helpful to bring up at this time. Um, is that accurate? 
Correct. Uh, and that's why we have the, the vetting from FDOT. So when they're going to the field, um, sometimes they go in the field, sometimes they do it virtually, but they also have their drainage people, everyone else from FDOT, it's a whole slew of people. And they're trying to get out ahead of that. So if these are going to be issues, right. they want to make note of them now. Right. right. And the other requirement, n nobody or no application, to your knowledge at this point, has gone around the public input process that's been required by the TPA for these applications, correct? They've all submitted the requirements with respect to public input? Correct. Um, okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I just... Um... Yeah, I don't want to drainage design anything. I just want to make sure those costs are, or that's being thought of now. So costs don't skyrocket and a project gets stopped and right in the middle because something was not um, designed for or thought of. So, so definitely. Could I, this Todd Engel, city engineer again, just one more thing. They are, these are hard to do because you're doing a conceptual, but you know, this is our road. We built it. We understand the drainage of it, and we do a we do a review to make sure it is buildable. So, in my opinion, it is buildable, and the drainage has already been thought of, and the gardens is committed to make this work. Sounds good to me. Okay, Thank you. so um, I had a couple questions. Um, and Tracy, if you're done, if you can put your tent card, and then um, oh, okay. Fadi, I think. Oh, Fadi, oh, go ahead, Fadi. I thought you put your card down. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, my comment is not related to this particular project. It just, you know, I was a bit surprised that there's only four who presented for applicants and the total amount requested is less than the amount available. And I'm wondering if, you know, along the line, what we spoke before, if TPA should it do more to help communities, maybe, especially those, you know, maybe uh, lower income communities, to present projects like this and have some program to assist them in the technical analysis and maybe initial review. Uh, and I, I know also the county probably would, would, would be more than happy to participate in that just to provide a larger pool of project, especially for underserved communities. Thank you. Do I respond on that? Go ahead. That's a great point, Patti. Um, I'm not sure if he was hinting at having the county administer projects but um, we do, I think it's a great point that you mentioned about encouraging that and, and trying to guide some um, communities on potential projects. Obviously we're doing these walk bike audits and there's potentials there and, and we, we help with uh, mobility studies. Um, some of the sticking points sometimes for these smaller communities is uh, being a, an administrating agency. And so really the only two options we have for that are, uh, well, the one is um, FDOT, which, um, can take some time. It's usually going to be further out in the work program because of that. Um, and then the other option sometimes is the county uh, assisting with administering the project. So it's really, um, I think the TPA can help with, with that upfront concept um, and helping these communities. Um, and then we'd have to figure out how to get it administered. Um, but it's a very good point. Okay. Um, on that note, what happens with the remaining money that goes unused yep uh, so it's a pretty small amount well what you see there it looks like a small amount it's in the hundred thousands range right so a lot of that would go um typically with that small amount it's most likely it's going to be um going towards like other projects that may have a cost overrun that are currently in the ta program or even the li program um, if it's an eligible thing so what we look at first is uh other eligible projects um, that may need the funding, whether it's cost overrun or if, if we can bring down the share of what the locals are paying for. Um, another kicker on that is um, the numbers aren't released yet for TA, but we are expecting a large increase in TA funding. So next year, you may see not $3 million to allocate, but 5 to $6 million potentially. So we'll have, a, and we, we might need to find places for um, products that you've already prioritized, there might be funding available in earlier years that we're gonna have to scramble to try to prioritize um, uh, on to, to accelerate. So, um, but the short answer is it typically for that amount of money, it'll go to another uh, another project and, and try to get everything um, programmed and implemented to move forward uh, for cost overruns. And then after that, if there's any avail money available, if it's large enough, we'll try to um, accelerate other products in the program. Okay. Um, you mentioned, uh staff change in the 
scoring that you redid this morning um, where the gardens was in, was the top ranking and now Indian Trails Improvement District um, has gotten an additional 10 points. Could you just look at that? And I'd be curious as to why the 10 additional points were included on the matrix. Yes, give me one second, I'll pull up the, uh, uh, the Excel um, and then I'll explain it for you verbally as well. Um, one second. So uh, regarding the, the, the ITID project, um, my original Excel here, unfortunately the, the formula wasn't capturing the top row, which is where the shared use um, pathways were. And they scored uh, 13 points in the shared use pathways, which is a big, a big amount. We cap the amount of uh, bicycle facilities at 10 points as well as pedestrian facilities. So they get 10 points total for that. And that's where that 10 points came from. So it, it jumped from um, originally 34 to 44. The other ones were not impacted by that row because uh, they didn't have shared use pathways. So there's no additional points for that. Um, but it was the one because we didn't, our formula didn't capture that top row. And that's a mistake on, on me. Just curious it, it, if the other, the CAC or the technical advisory committees, have they see, I know you said it was this morning, but um, wondering if you would send that out to them just in case there was other comments. Um, the, the TA only goes to you all oh, for okay. this round. Yep. The only time they're going to see this list is when after you all uh, provide your recommendations, they'll see it in the list of priority projects. So they'll so see these at the bottom of the, of the list of priority projects. Okay. Well, that's good. So everybody get ready because next year we're going to have double the amount of funding. So next year we probably will be having an afternoon meeting for those of you who, and it's a, usually a pretty long process and um, we try to have fun. So John. With, with that comment of mine with regards to the increase in funding and the hope that we do get a significant number of projects and to Fadi's comment about the lack of projects that have been submitted this time, I, I think a lot of it is there's a lot of resources that have to be allocated towards even determining the project, you know, putting together the application, you know, providing the materials and, and so forth. So, you know, I think if there's some assistance to these municipalities or jurisdictions that don't necessarily have those resources to invest, to even make the application for the money, yet alone management of the project and so forth, you know, I think that would be beneficial um, in increasing the number of potential projects that, that would be submitted. So just something to consider is to where that assistance can be best provided, not only in implementation, but maybe potentially application. So. Okay. Madam Chair, I do see, Tracy, did you have additional questions? Okay, Tracy. Is there anything? Is there anything in the scoring that takes into account uh, the first one? One that's first now is right. There's a school right in the area. Um, when I saw that there's a school, and actually just a, a great view drive just on the north end of that section. There's it's actually there's a school zone there. So uh, I was wondering if uh, I think. Um, walkways, uh, sidewalks, things like that should definitely be scored higher if there's school, if there's an elementary school or middle school in the area to provide, since we're really a vision zero um, and um, safety for school kids, very important. We, uh, you all uh, adopted scoring that has uh, project is within two miles of a school and within its school attendance bound boundary and you uh, provide five points um, if it's within that. So all of them had met those criteria. So they all got five points for that. Okay. 
Brian? Uh, just kind of also talking about funding and thinking about what the city is programming this year and some of the ask. We're using the federal government programs pretty extensively this year too. So the TPA's existing programs are also competing, I think, a little bit with resources that are now out and about. I, I know we're going after at least two federal grants this year for infrastructure in Delray for these type of programs. So TPA's maybe competing with those just a little bit. Um, similarly for, I can envision that happening for the next, um, thank you, few, few years um, as more money comes down the pipeline, but any money for planning studies, especially for vision and zero action plans would be appreciated as we're going for a grant for that. One comment I thought, as I'm looking at the scoring in particular for the last two categories, Royal Palm Beach um, is simply installing bicycle pedestrian wayfinding, whereas West Palm Beach really is doing a bicycle boulevard treatment or otherwise referred to as a neighborhood type greenway. Um, I would put it out to the committee that the inf installation of infrastructure probably should always be prioritized over the installation of kind of the accessory type facilities. So wayfinding would be one of them. Wayfinding is great to have, but the, the thing that will move the needle on biking and walking commute rates and transportation rates are actual infrastructure. So I was just interested that, and I'm not proposing rescoring because the scores I think are marginally different. Um, it makes no difference because there's still available funding, but the installation of infrastructure should always um, be prioritized. And it's something to keep in mind, I think for next year as we move forward into getting more projects on the ground. Andrew, do you wanna follow up with anything before we sure. motion? Sure, I do have one one final thing for you. It's not um, a great look, Soil Royal Palm Beach. Um, they don't have a, um, they didn't submit a full uh, design of their kiosks and all that. Um, and so I just wanted to show you real quick in their typical section. Well, but Bruce is uh, just thought <laughs> that's okay, but I'll show you anyway. Well, while you bring it up, you know, it's very hard to do wayfinding. You know, it's a very sensitive issue with the community. We're going through some for our downtown. Mm. So concepts are always being changed. So they have a, a, a just a, a basic one um, design. So they'll have maps of uh, of their village, and it's going to be near their their sidewalks, and then. Um, they'll do the same thing for smaller types of signage. Uh, the example they have uh, is, you know, pointing to the mileage away from a recreational center. And then also in their typical section, they provided uh, an example of what or where it will be located for a, uh, a type of um, shelter. And that's all I had for you. Thank you. I don't see any more cards up. Do we have a motion on the 2022 Transportation Alternatives Program project rankings? Ms. Brian, uh, move to adopt as presented. Do we have a second? A second. Tracy, second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, so the next item is an informational item on Brightline. And yes, we have Ali Soul will be uh, virtual. Okay, Brightline. Hi, uh, can you uh, can you see me and hear me? Good yes. morning. Yes. yes. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, my name is Ali Soul. I'm the Vice President of Community Relations at Brightline. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting us to participate uh, and to provide an update today. Next slide. Uh, so as a friendly reminder, Brightline is the only privately owned and operated inner city express rail service in the United States. Uh, I'm sure most of you know uh, that we operate our phase one system in South Florida. Uh, we have our, our second project that will connect Southern California with Las Vegas under development. Uh, so we look forward to hopefully uh, moving that forward soon. 
And there are other corridors around the nation that we believe would be uh, strong contenders for what we what we think is uh, the goal of connecting key city pairs that are too long to drive and too short to fly. Next slide. Uh, so Brightline has done a heck of a lot over the past couple of months. We were temporarily suspended during COVID for about 18 months, but we relaunched service in November uh, and are, we're off to a great start. Um, we hired about 200 new teammates. We launched Brightline Plus, which is our new door-to-door -door mobility service. Uh, we continued with construction of our additional two inline stations in Aventura and Boca Raton. And we also continue to accelerate our construction between uh, West Palm Beach and Orlando. Um, to date, uh, the Orlando extension is nearly 75% complete. Uh, there have been 5.2 million man hours worked and each day there are more than 1300 people uh, on the ground. Next slide. Uh, for those of you who haven't been on Brightline, uh, I thought it was important to give a, an overview on where our stations are located. Uh, our downtown Miami station uh, connects to Metro Rail, Metro Mover. Ultimately, it will connect with TriRail. Uh, it's about a seven minute walk to the FTX arena. Uh, it is within walking distance of the the courthouses and the uh, county facility. Our station in Orlando is at the airport. Uh, it is part of the intermodal terminal facility, which if you've been to the Miami intermodal facility at the Miami airport, they're very similar. Uh, they will ultimately have uh, additional transportation connections. It's connected to the North terminal via an automated people mover. Uh, and the ITF at the Orlando airport is going to be the hub uh, of their new South terminal, which will expand the airport's capacity by about 120 gates. And that facility exists. Uh, Brightline is in the process of uh, building out its station. And then uh, we uh, have our stations in Aventura. That station is being constructed. It is across the street from the mall, um, although not easy to access. Uh, so the ultimate vision for the project and what we're working on is to build a pedestrian overpass that will connect the station directly with the Aventura Mall um, and obviously to the east side. Uh, our station in Fort Lauderdale is just north of Broward Boulevard. Our station in Boca is across from Meister Park. And in West Palm Beach, uh, we're located uh, to the south of, uh, uh, to the north of the square and to the south of Clamata Street. Next slide now. Thank you. Brightline Plus is our new door-to-door -door service powered by our app and supported by a fleet of Brightline branded vehicles. Uh, we have shared rides and Tesla private rides that take you within a five mile radius of our station. We also have Circuit, uh, which is the electric golf cart that takes you within a mile of our station. And in West Palm Beach, we just launched uh, our bike share program, Bright Bikes, which we're very excited uh, to bring to downtown West Palm Beach. Next slide. So I mentioned phase two, we are on track to Orlando. This is just uh, a snapshot of uh, some of the construction progress and milestones that we've made. I do have a video to show, it's on the next slide. And that video actually only uh, describes or goes into detail about the portion of our project between this, uh, that's along the State Road 528 right of way uh, between Coco and the airport. And it really is uh, incredible to see uh, how how massive uh, and what an undertaking uh, the construction of this project is. So next slide and will you please play the video?
Next slide. Uh, and so this project is really full of innovations, and quite frankly, it has to be. Um, a project of this magnitude does not get constructed uh, without uh, the partnerships from local agencies. Uh, this corridor, uh, especially for the Bright Line project, goes through eight counties and more than 50 cities. Uh, we are constructing along the right of way where freight traffic uh, continues to operate uh, and then there's obviously multiple, there's uh, interstate highway systems, uh, and then we also are working through airport property, uh, which is pretty significant. Um, but I always like to remind people about what the phase two scope of work is. Um, so from West Palm Beach to Cocoa, we are double tracking the Florida East Coast Railway Brightline Corridor, similar to what we did for our phase one project. All crossings will be upgraded to meet the standards set by the Federal Railroad Administration and the Florida Department of Transportation. Um, all crossings on our corridor have gates, bells, whistles, signage, pavement markings. Uh, they have all of the infrastructure that is required uh, to warn motorists, pedestrians, and bicyclists uh, that a train is approaching where we will exceed 79 miles per hour. Uh, we are installing uh, F, what it, the FRA calls sealed corridor. Uh, this specifically refers to the gates at the crossings, not the areas in between. Uh, so in areas where we go higher than 79 miles per hour, uh, we'll have four quadrant gates or non-traversable medians in place. Uh, we're also installing positive train control. This is a federal mandate. Uh, we already have it operational in our system between Miami and West Palm Beach. Uh, vehicle presence detection, uh, and then we are uh, re either replacing or rehabilitation, re rehabilitating, excuse me, the many bridges, um, uh, some over navigable waterways, some not. So we have three bridges over navigable waterways. Uh, next slide. I just tried to change it myself and realized I couldn't, uh, including the Loxahatchee River Bridge. Uh, so uh, specifically for Palm Beach County, 88% of the crossings are complete, 23 of 26 uh, of the three remaining. Uh, we expect them to be completed uh, in the second half of this year. That schedule is obviously subject to change, uh, but our construction team gives uh, at, at least two weeks notice uh, on the crossing improvements. So obviously motorists, Palm Tran, others who are traversing in that area can make sure that they can adjust uh, their route as needed. And then I mentioned the Loxahatchee River, so the Loxahatchee River uh, is in uh, Jupiter and Tequesta. That rehabilitation of the Bascule Bridge will begin on April 10th on Sunday. Uh, today, that structure is a single track. Uh, that structure is a double track, but only has one track as part of it. As part of the project, we will add that second track to the bridge. And then we will also increase the vertical clearance of one span uh, to 14 inches doing that in coordination with the Jupiter Inlet District that will provide for additional uh, clearance for uh, more boats to be able to go under the bridge when it's in the down position. Uh, we do have a text message system that we launched uh, that allows mariners to opt in and receive updates as to when the bridge will be open uh, and how uh, the construction impacts uh, are going. Next slide, please. So I, I obviously can't end any presentation or, or not do a presentation and talk about what Brightline believes is our, our most important priority, uh, which is the safety, safety of our guests, the safety of the communities in which we operate, the safety of our teammates. All of them are paramount to us. Uh, and so we look at safety in a three-prong approach. And we really have been trying new and innovative means uh, to continue to get the safety message out there and frankly to get people to pay attention and to understand how to be safe around uh, active railroad tracks. In the engineering bucket, for example, uh, we installed two red light cameras in North Miami. Um, Brightline is not a law enforcement agency, uh, so we worked closely with the Florida East Coast Railway Police uh, to send warning letters uh, to motorists who either went around the gates or stopped on the tracks. In the three or four months that we had those red light cameras up, we issued more than 900 citations, excuse me, warning letters, uh, and some of those warning letters went to the same person or the same vehicle uh, more than once. 
As a result of that, we were able to determine that there's obviously a problem in that area. And we went to local law enforcement and asked them to help us uh, step up the outreach uh, and make sure that people understood like that what they're doing is breaking the law and it's very dangerous um, for them and for those around them. We're also uh, partnering with the Florida Department of Transportation to go after a RAISE grant. Uh, that is a new grant program that's available in this upcoming cycle. Applications are due in April. Uh, this would be a $45 million scope that would encompass additional safety enhancements from Miami-Dade to, Brev to Brevard counties. Uh, it would include additional uh, corridor intrusion methods, uh, fencing, landscaping, delineators along the corridor at the crossings uh, to show people and to make sure people know that turning onto the tracks, uh, that's not where they're supposed to be, uh, in addition to additional signage uh, along the corridor and key places. Um, in, in addition, we have local law enforcement that continues to step up. For example, uh, uh, Lake Worth, uh, the Palm Beach Sheriff's Office in Lake Worth actually did uh, an operation for, I think it was about a week, uh, maybe two weeks. Uh, during those two weeks, they enforced, uh, you know, around the railroad crossings and they issued uh, more than 200 citations, warning people and letting them know uh, that the things that they were doing were dangerous um, and illegal. In addition, uh, we have a very comprehensive safety outreach program with that's available in English, Spanish, Creole, and Portuguese. Uh, and mental health, we believe, is a key a, a key item uh, that we support. Uh, obviously, Brightline is not a mental health provider, but we work closely with 211 and other mental health resources to make sure that people understand that there are resources in the community that they can turn to, um, you know, and, and that in mental health wellness is important. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right, do we have any public comment on this item, RG? No, Madam Chair. Okay, so let's start with John. Hi, good morning, Allie. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I believe it's been brought up in some of the other updates that you've done and committee meetings and so forth, but I think one of the concerns with regards to the crossings here in downtown while the facilities are there, all the gates are there and so forth, is we have the issue where we have the triple track, which created a substantially wider crossing. And the problem is, is myself included, is that by the time the signal starts and the gates start going down, there's not sufficient time to actually make it to the other side of the, the crossing before the second gate is coming down. So you kind of get stuck between the gates. And I mean, say myself included, so I can't imagine for um, an elderly or someone who's disabled or, or something like that, you know, being able to get outside the crossing before the, the second set of gates come down. So, you know, I don't know if the, the length of time is dependent upon the width of the crossing or if it's just purely, you know, the speed of the train or what have you. So it's something that I would definitely encourage. And I'm not saying it's just a bright line issue because obviously the freight trains and so forth, but um, you know, it is a concern in, in those heavy pedestrian environments. Um, well, that, that question actually came up yesterday, uh, and I got with my technical team, uh, and Margie, I will be sending out, uh, this answer. So if you can help me circulate it to the other, uh, the citizens advisory group and the technical group, and then those, but essentially, um, the short answer is, uh, the, when the, well, for Clematis, the Clematis Street is set for about 42 seconds of warning time, um, plus 15 seconds of advanced uh, preemption. Whereas a single track that was before Brightline came in was for 30 seconds. So that 42 seconds takes into account the additional distance. Um, and our team has actually gone out and looked at the crossing. So, so the crossing is working as designed and it's in compliance uh, with standard practices throughout the corridor and with FRA regulations. I will continue to take that back to the team, um, but you know, I do want people to know that we obviously have heard, um, have heard the questions on the crossing and it has been studied uh, and looked at and made sure that it is working uh, properly. But I will get uh, a succinct answer for you as well. 
Thank you. Yeah. Say so maybe meeting, you know, all the the requirements. It's just, you know, from a practicality and, you know, actually walking the crossing many times myself. You know, I found myself getting getting stuck in there. And I mean, you potentially have to duck under the second set of gates to to complete the crossing. And, you know, not everyone has the capability to do that. So, yeah, if you can continue to look in and it, into it, it'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to note for you, Allie, that I will share that information when you send it over. For Thank the other you. committees, you're welcome. Just on that, John and um, Allie, I'm just wondering if there's any coordination with the City of West Palm um, on the timing, if this is a, I mean, I can only imagine, you know, driving into the downtown today, it's because there's so much traffic and people are queuing and sometimes you can't move. So I'm just wondering, you know, is it an opportunity for Brightline and this, you know, the traffic folks from the city of West Palm to coordinate? Well, the, the biggest concern is, uh, I don't think it's been so much from a vehicular standpoint. The biggest concern that I'm expressing and has been expressed a number of times is pedestrians. Being able to make the crossing as a pedestrian from the time that the signal starts, notifying you that the crossing is going to close, to make it across that triple track in time before the second gate comes down. I've, as a pedestrian walking from our city garage to city hall, you know, we make that crossing multiple times a day. You get stuck in between there. Um, you know, I like to think I'm an able bodied <laughs> capable, you know, to, to make that crossing, but I've found myself stuck. You know, I can't imagine someone who's in a wheelchair or using a walker or what have you. Um, and then, may not be able to, to duck underneath the, the second gate if necessary. Again, I will take it back to the team. Uh, on your chair, on your question on the queuing, I think that brings up an important, uh, you know, an important distinction that, you know, it is illegal uh, to stop on the railroad tracks. Uh, and we need to enforce the mindset that individuals uh, who are in traffic should not be pulling up uh, and, you know, anticipating that traffic is going to continue moving and they will be able to clear the crossing, right? That is how these incidents happen. People are not paying attention. They find out that they're stopped on the tracks. There's someone in front of them. The gates go down. They have nowhere to go, right? And that is a, a very dangerous, it is a, it can be a deadly scenario. Uh, and so, we need to continue to re reinforce to people that the only safe place to stop is outside of the gates, right? That is that is the law. That is what the Florida statute states. Uh, and that's what we've been trying to work with law enforcement on is making sure that they're out there reminding people what they're doing, uh, because you're exactly right. People can get stuck. That's how, you know, the if you, the, you can try to reverse or move and, you know, you're the front of your car gets hit, but you're still getting hit and there's still the potential for you to be hurt and for those around you to be hurt. Um, and so from a queuing perspective, we need to make sure that people are not queuing on the railroad tracks, period. Mr. Good Enough. You're, you're getting there. I found it. Good. Okay. Good morning, Ali. A great presentation. I just have two comments and a question. I'll go with the question first. In the on the plus door-to-door, uh, -door, is there an additional cost to that? And is it based on distance from door to door? Uh, my two comments, I'm among other things, the event coordinator for the guide dog handlers of the Palm Beaches. And we took eight teams on Brightline down to Miami from West Palm and back. And Everybody was extremely courteous, very helpful in helping a bunch of um, uh, blind folk get to where they needed to be. And so I, I offer my appreciation for that. On the video that you showed, without um, audio description, anyone on a cell phone has no idea what you showed. And anyone with a visual impairment is in the same boat. So I would recommend that you look into audio description for any videos that you're going to do at a presentation or put on your website so that everyone has access to them. 
I, I will take that back to the team. I appreciate your comment on our, uh, on our, our teammates in the station. Uh, they are, they are the best, they are trained, uh, you know, to be focused on the guest experience and to make sure that all guests are having, uh, a great time. And we actually do partner, uh, with, uh, with organizations or with groups uh, that that focus on individuals with disabilities that might not have been on a train before or want to experience it for the first time. So it is something that we try to uh, incorporate, you know, from a community partnership standpoint. As for Brightline Plus, uh, we are going to start charging for Brightline Plus. Uh, the private rides will be, uh, the, they're $10 one way. Uh, it, it's $10. $10, $10 no matter where you go within that five mile radius. Uh, we also have the shared rides uh, and then the golf carts. The golf carts will remain free, but I expect over the next couple of weeks that we will really announce that that pricing structure uh, and provide more information on our website and in the mobile app. Thank you very much for your time and responses. Great. Thank you. So Brian is next. Hi, Ali. Thank you for coming and presenting on behalf of Brightline today. Um, we're excited for you all to go after a uh, raise grant. How can we get more information about what areas of improvement in communities that you're seeking to improve fencing and landscaping along? Is that uh, something you'd be willing to share? Um, so it would be something that we would we'll be working with cities with. Um, when and if the grant uh, is approved and allocated, um, you know, in going through this process as Brightline has worked with communities to get multiple grants, uh, just because the scope you put in doesn't mean that that's the scope um, that ultimately is approved by the Federal Railroad Administration. You can also put in a request for X amount of dollars and they give you X minus X and you don't end up you know, and then you have to change the project scope. Um, so I think it's a little premature, um, you know, from a, a wide public standpoint to talk, because if we're not able to fulfill that, right, based on the grants, um, but we would definitely, once, if the grant is awarded, we would be happy to come back and present an update to the board uh, and to make sure that everybody is aware about the improvements that we're going to do. I, I will say, Brian, uh, that we did do a pilot corridor intrusion project in South Palm Beach County, uh, Delray Beach, uh, Boynton Beach and Lantana were part of that. If you've dr driven along the corridor in certain areas, you might've seen that uh, where we installed fencing and native Florida native landscaping uh, in certain key areas to prevent uh, intrusion. And since we've installed that landscaping, we haven't had really any incidents in those areas. Fencing doesn't work everywhere. Um, you know, especially we've seen in downtown Delray, they installed that very nice decorative fence and, you know, several weeks after it was installed several years ago, it was damaged um, and then the city had to come back and fix it. So we really do look at it from a holistic approach as to what is the, you know, what is the best means of resistance in that area. Right. Thank you. I just, uh, I know that sometimes I guess this can feel like a game of whack-a-mole with where yeah. you install landscaping and, and fencing to try to, you know, improve the safety along the corridor. Uh, the only thing I would venture to say is that, you know, if there's any evaluation, you have your, you know, engineering, education, and enforcement. If there's an evaluation component that you could add to it, that would help identify some of the systemic type issues that are facing. It might strengthen the grant and the cities might be able to be a partner in that. Um, moving yeah. forward. So thank you. Appreciate those comments. I will say that the grant, we, it is, we are working right based on data, right. Of incidents where we know have occurred, where our crews see stuff happening, where our engineering team goes out and looks at certain instances. So all of that is taken into consideration with the proposed improvements, uh, and then evaluated by, uh, the federal railroad administration. There's your fourth E. There you go. There. David, do you have comments, questions? Yeah, uh, good morning, Ali. I, I thought it was a great presentation. Um, I just had a question about the quiet zones. Um, the news around here loves to focus on fatalities and, and uh, they, they love to have those stories on. They also have stories about revoking the quiet zone. Um, it is, I, I haven't heard any other discussion other than on the news. Uh, is, is this factual or are they just making this up? Um, well, I think that you just said the most important word, which is 
facts, right? We have to operate uh, from a place of facts. Um, so uh, taking even a step back, uh, Quiet zones uh, are a federal process that public authorities must apply for. Uh, the railroad has no part in the application or, you know, if the quiet zone ceases to exist, um, there is a, a federal uh, process that's outlined where you have to implement supplemental safety measures, run a calculator to make sure that that risk uh, is lowered because you're taking away another safety improvement, which is the horn. And at that point, the FRA can say this meets the threshold that's required for the quiet zones. They are approved. The Federal Railroad Administration uh, is very aware of what is happening in South Florida. Uh, and they hosted uh, in the past eight months, uh, two workshops in South Florida uh, to address uh, the incidents that we are facing. And I think the message that came from it and you know, Valerie uh, from the TPA was there and uh, represented the TPA, uh, Todd uh, Ben Lauren attended as well. Uh, is that this is a community problem, which is why we need cities to help get education out. We need law enforcement to help address the problem and make sure people know what they're doing is illegal. Um, and the FRA did talk a little bit about quiet zones. They have the ability to rescind them if they, if, if something is occurring, Brightline does not. They did not in that meeting talk about that being um, an imminent uh, you know, an eminent action, uh, but they do want our region to step up to the plate and do everything that we can do to try to lower the amount of incidents that we're having. I will add one more. It's, a, add so it's, it's up to the federal government then. Uh, yes, and I will add one more thing, David, is that the FRA actually has come down several times. Um, the city of West Palm Beach hosted a quiet zone workshop uh, in their, you know, bottom floor conference room. Uh, and then they did field diagnostics for the phase two segment to determine, you know, what, what infrastructure is there, what infrastructure is needed for quiet zones and to help cities with us. So Kim Delaney at the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council is leading that effort on behalf of the Palm Beach TPA. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the FRA is down here working with lo local governments in the phase two segment about how they can achieve uh, the quiet zones if they wish to apply. Great, that answers the question, thank you. All right, so Tracy, you, I see your card up. That'd be interesting uh, when you respond to uh, John's comments, uh, what the walking speed that they used uh, to calculate uh, the uh, time for the gates are, from where the gates are going down. I know the uh, railway, 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 railroads have their way of doing things, and they were here first, uh, so they rule. Um, so they could be using to come up. I think you said forty-two seconds. They be, they could be using a walking speed of a normal, like four sec, four feet per second. Whereas down here, South Florida, when we set flashing don't walk times. Uh, we use 3.5 seconds and sometimes even three seconds, three feet per second because of the older population and the slower walking speeds. So I just, um, in your response, I uh, would be interested uh, what the walking speed that they used in their calculations uh, for the uh, time that the gates go down. Because it really does sound like um, 42 seconds is a lot of time, but John looks like a very healthy man. So if he's not making it across in time, uh, something doesn't seem to be working right. Again, I'll definitely take this back to the team. Okay, Fadi, do you have comments or questions? Thanks, Ali. Great presentation and I'm really happy to be in a county served by Brightline. Hopefully in the future you can take it to Orlando. In fact, my comment is probably more for West Palm Beach, for John, than, than for you. I know you mentioned you have concern with pedestrian at crosswalk. And of course, all of us, we do. But I think uh, West Palm Beach should also be concerned about traffic and the impact on traffic. Uh, I know today it took me probably four times more driving this mile than coming from the office. The same thing happened last, last month. I don't know how it's going to be in the future. 
so I would appreciate West Palm Beach in coordination with CPA will, you know, consider also traffic when you plan for Okeechobee or any parallel corridor, because this is your lifeline. I mean, this is your artery bringing traffic to your, to your downtown area. And I hope you take this into consideration. Thank you. And John, do you have another? Yeah, just one question for Ali. With regards to the Brightline Plus, does that five mile radius, does that encompass all the um, airports that are near the, the various stations? For example, you know, the Fort Lauderdale Airport, Miami, West Palm, so forth? Uh, so we will be announcing soon as well that, uh, and we actually currently offer it, but we do offer shuttle service uh, to the airport from the Brightline station, not from the airport to the Brightline station uh, for Miami and Fort Lauderdale. Um, we're potentially going to be doing something different for, for the PBI, uh, but today it is for Miami and Fort Lauderdale. I will say though that the Miami station also connects directly to the airport via the Metro Rail Orange Line. Uh, so that is also an easy uh, transport. David, okay. do you have another comment? No. Okay. Um, I, Ali, I was glad to hear, um, actually my question was the continuing time frame for Brightline Plus, um, because I, I've used it, the free service, it's great. Um, but and I didn't want it to end, so um, I think charging is, is the great is a really good next step because it was very convenient. Um, it worked really well, um, so good to hear that. And I'll take that back to the team. We uh, we like to hear good feedback on Brightline Plus. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Oh, and and then oh, Michael Owens is on the line. Thank you, Margie. He's got a comment as well. Hey, good morning. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I was able to actually get on Brightline, I think January of 2020, right before all hell broke loose. And we took it from West Palm down to Miami. And it was fun. It was really fun. I think they were offering um, some sort of, you know, discounted rides. So we took the whole family and we had a great time. Um, I'm curious about the um, extension to, to Orlando. And and forgive me if I, if I you know, overlook something, but are, will you just have a one station in Orlando or you have a couple? I would assume you'd have something south of Orlando as well as Orlando proper. Uh, so uh, our stations will be uh, Miami, our, our current announced stations will be Miami, Aventura, Fort Lauderdale, Boca, West Palm Beach, and then Orlando. Uh, we're focused obviously on completing the Orlando sec segment, uh, getting our phase one inline stations uh, finished construction and operational. Uh, and then we will focus our efforts on additional expansion opportunities. Uh, we are we committed to the Treasure Coast uh, to develop a station in either Martin or St. Lucie counties within five years of opening operations to Orlando. Brevard County is very interested in a station location there. TPO did a study that indicated that COCO, uh, they believe that COCO is the best place for a station. Uh, and we're also looking at Disney Springs and then working with the Florida Department of Transportation and the Central Florida community about uh, a, an ultimate connection to Tampa. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. I think that I think that's all the comments. Thank you so much. Thank you for bringing Brightline to the east coast of Florida. We desperately need it. We used to have transit um, when Flagler envisioned it a hundred years ago. And by the way, I hope you can get the bridge at, by my house across the Loxahatchee river done quickly because <laughs> I watch it and hear the pilings being driven on Sunday. Um, and hope that goes efficiently and thank you again. I appreciate it all. Thank you very much. Do we have anything else before we move on? Everybody's good? Okay, so then um, our next item is the long range transportation plan update and Connor is going to present to us. Um, he's the TPA LRTP coordinator. Thanks, Connor. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, 
I'm Connor Capabasso with the Palm Beach CPA, and today I'm going to be going over a um, quick update, um, more, of, more of an overview of the LRTP process and where we're at. Uh, we're getting into what we call the LRTP season, and um, this is where you're going to be seeing probably a lot more of me as we go through the LRTP and planning process um, uh, over the next uh, couple of years. Um, but I did want to start off with talking about um, our core products as a whole. So we have three uh, major core products, first of which is the UPWP or the Unified Planning Work Program. Um, and you may be familiar with this. You just saw this, um, I, I believe, last month, um, at least a draft of it, and you'll be uh, seeing it again for adoption soon. Um, but this is our financial planning document, and this takes place over the course. It's a two-year uh, focus time period, um, and that's updated every two years. Um, next, we have the TIP, or the Transportation Improvement Program, which is a five-year plan. Um, and this includes all of our funded um, and prioritized um, projects. So anything that we fund through the TPA is included in that, uh, in that document. Um, and that, again, goes out for uh, five years, and that's updated uh, annually. And then finally, we have our LRTP, which is our Long Range Transportation Plan. Um, and this is required to be a 20-year uh, planning horizon, so a 20-year plan, um, updated every five years. Um, however, due to uh, a variety of different factors, we actually do uh, an additional five years on top of that, uh, leading us to a 25-year plan, and I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So what is an LRTP? Well, uh, it maps out the future uh, state and federal transportation investments. It also serves as the foundation for the development of that uh, TIP, that Transportation Improvement Program. Uh, it reflects the region's goals through project prioritization and also uh, financial uh, components guide how the plan can be implemented. Now, we did just go through this process not too long ago. So back in 2019, we adopted the 2045 plan. Um, and as it uh, um, is noted, it is a 25-year plan, so it brought us to the horizon year of 2045. Uh, in that plan, it defined the uh, priority pedestrian and bicyclist corridors. It also established the 561 transit plan, as well as performance measures and targets, and then finally outlined uh, all the funding programs for the TPA. Um, so this uh, is guided by several documents, uh, one of the most important of which is uh, Title 23 of the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, this sets forth uh, several guidances of what an LRTP must have. So like I mentioned, it's a minimum of 20 years with five-year updates. Uh, it includes the development of an integrated multimodal system, includes uh, operation and management strategies, congestion management processes, um, it, uh, assessment of capital investments, as well as transportation and transit enhancement activities, environmental mitigation activities, and then finally that financial plan that I was talking about earlier. Um, also, uh, there's another document. It's the uh, FHWA's planning emphasis areas. Uh, they just did an update in 2021. 20, uh, um, and this now includes uh, tracking of climate crises, um, uh, equity, and justice 40, uh, complete streets efforts, public involvement uh, strategies, as well as uh, coordination between the DOD, as well as the Federal Land Management Agency. Um, it also includes planning and environmental linkages, as well as uh, data and transportation planning. So that brings us to uh, the document itself. So for 2050, uh, we want to answer a variety of, di of different questions, including what will 2050 populations, employment, and travel look like? what our vision and how we will measure performance, uh, what our needs and priorities are for the region, as well as what we want travel to look like, how we'll pay for it, and finally, how we are going to implement it. So there is a, uh, a lot of stuff to be done, and this is just the beginning. So you'll, again, be seeing a lot of presentations from me. Um, so. Uh, right now, we're in the procurement phase, so we are still working on the scoping effort. Uh, we're expecting that to be done in summer of 2022, and you'll be seeing a few presentations on that as well, as well as an action item that will be brought to you all. After which, we will go into advertisement, so that will be in fall 2022, and then selection of the consultants in winter 2022, and then the uh, start of the contract, which will also take place in winter 2022, potentially bleeding into uh, the new year of January 2023. 
Long-term goals, however, uh, you'll be seeing a couple other items brought to you as well. So in summer of 2023, you'll see the goals, objectives, and measures. Uh, in spring 2024, the cost feasible plan. And then finally, uh, in winter 2024, we're hoping to wrap this up and you'll be voting on the document itself. Now, I did mention earlier that we do a 25-year plan. Um, one of the major reasons is we also do a regional transportation plan, so that's the RTP, and that's shared between us, Broward, as well as Miami-Dade. Uh, they all operate on 25-year LRTPs as well, and thus the RTP itself is a 25-year planning horizon, and they are done simultaneously. So right now, uh, we just wrapped up the scoping effort in uh, for the RTP, and we're moving into procurement. Uh, Miami-Dade's going to be handling that. And then in the end of 2022, we'll be wrapping up procurement similar to the R, uh, LRTP and then moving forward with the document planning process. Um, and that is all I have for you today. Um, again, this was just a general um, introduction to the LRTP. Like I mentioned, you're going to be seeing a lot of me uh, giving presentations about the process moving forward. So I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Thanks. Margie, do we have any public comment? No, Madam Chair. Okay. so. Anybody have any comments or questions? Bruce? I don't know why it caught my attention, but there was coordination with the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. Can you give an example of what? what so there are strategic highways uh, throughout our region, and really that coordination with the DOD is involved with maintaining those uh, strategic corridors, things like I-95, making sure that military operations can still operate on those different corridors. That's my understanding. Um, it could be a little bit more detailed than that, but we're gonna be looking into that a little bit more as we go forward. John. Thanks, Connor. Um, just one question as part of the scope, is it gonna include going back and kind of evaluating how well we did in preparing previous plans you know were we close were we really far off I mean obviously 25 years is a long time you know to anticipate what's going to happen within there absolutely um but obviously any lessons learned that we can have by evaluating the past plans I, I think would be beneficial in predicting yep so um actually currently in our uh draft scope we do have some of that um review included we're still trying to figure out to what degree. There was a question that was brought up yesterday. Uh, should we be looking at the model results of 2025? And I think that might be a little bit more detailed. So we're trying to find a nice balance. We don't want to obviously spend all of our finances um, reviewing old plans. We want to look forward. But we are going to be doing some of that document, at least review of uh, older plans and seeing how we can improve upon previous uh, LRTPs. Yeah, and not just from a modeling standpoint, but, you know, anticipating what the goals and objectives and so forth are, are going to be how well were we at you know achieving you know those goals that were in past plans and how can we learn from that you yeah, know to make sure we're we're more successful in, in achieving them absolutely okay anybody else one question i had um as we move forward with population counts and demographics given the great migration and the impacts it's had on our region, which has been pretty substantial. We've been undercounted um, given the census timing and the pandemic. Um, so just making sure we follow back through with other, other, um, other methods in order to capture that, not just Bieber, but perhaps um, driver's licenses, things like that, that can, we could probably capture to ensure we get correct counts, because I know for Jupiter, we were definitely undercounted. Um, and when you drive around these days, and I'm sure everybody is feeling that, you know, how all that works together is going to be really interesting as we move forward. Anybody else? Oh, Brian? Just a quick thought, you know, I, I go back to the TPA's economic development forum and the comments from Rafael Clemente. He was the individual who also led our walking tour some time ago, and he 
alluded to the fact that the model sometimes doesn't take into account very well pedestrian-based activity. You use some case studies from specifically uh, one company where 50% of the downtown jobs at a site with 100 employees at an office are walking, biking, or taking transit to work. So do you anticipate the Serpum 9 model doing a better job of that in the development? Because I know it's a regional model. What's right. the discussion look like currently? Um, well, Andrew, do you want to? Uh, what I'll say is we're, we're working on it. Uh, obviously, it is a model that was originally designed to model traffic volumes. So it is something that we're working to get closer towards. I don't know, Andrew, if you have any more you want to add? No, to not really. Um, I know that uh, our regions in the server model are trying to, to put in the other types of modes and, and have you know, more accurate and more effective modeling for that. Um, the TPA is going to do some type of model. Like, there will be some type of demand analysis on pedestrian bicycle facilities um, and activity levels and for transit as well. So all modes. Um, if it's going to be through SERPM, uh, I guess we'll just see how well that's, that's turning out. Um, but we do plan on doing a demand analysis. Right. It seems like similarly to population adjustment, that might be necessary. There might need to be some additional factors that are played into that as well. Thank you. Good point. Okay. So on to the last item, administrative items. Um, items 4 and A, 4A and B are informational. There's no staff presentation unless requested by a committee member. Um, is there any public comments on the informational items, Margie? No, Madam Chair. Okay. Great. It's four, not four, 1038. Our next Vision Zero Advisory Committee meeting is going to be on May 5th. And we're adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.